My name is Pinely, but it's spelt in a dumb way, like... K. It may not look like it, but I'm actually 15 years old. In our society, every teenager is forced to sit down and watch 11 teen dystopian movies. Our power supply is run by other teens just like me, ranking these movies. So, that's what I'm gonna do now. Okay, these are the rules. We're only talking about teen dystopias, which means young adult movies, which are taking place in like a bleak future that probably says something about today's society. Specifically the ones that count, the big three franchises that dominated the 2010s back when I was a teenager. That means four Hunger Games, three Divergent, three Maze Runner, and now you're like, oh, but you said 11 movies for the uh, power supply thing. Well, with the new Hunger Games coming out, I'm a bit hopeful that this once great genre is about to make a comeback. So after I watch these 10 movies, I will go to make sure that our future is not a dystopia by watch by watching the new Hunger Games. I'll just I'm just gonna go and watch the new Hunger Games, and I'm just gonna go and make sure that it's good. If you guys like this and subscribe and all that, I'll do one where I talk about all the ones that weren't good enough for a franchise as well. Hunger Games, the mother of the teen dystopian franchise. Mamma mia. This right here was the shit when I was a teenager, and it still is, let me tell you right here. The book more so than the movie, but I, I still like the, the movie. It's a, it's a good movie. Boom, Jennifer Lawrence as Katniss Everdeen. What a great performance, ladies and gentlemen. Boom, there are 12 districts, one capital. That's a dickhead, and everyone there is dressed up like a clown. These assholes just take two kids from each district and make everyone fight to the death once a year, like in Fortnite. Suzanne Collins, the author of the book, Book, she got a uh, special intel some inside industry info that they're gonna make Fortnite, and she was like I gotta capitalize on this uh, a few years before they make this incredible game I'm gonna be spoiling a lot of things in this movie and all the movies that we're gonna talk about so uh, Watch out, but yeah all in all grew up on this movie casting in this movie and all the movies in this franchise is pretty great. Josh uh, Hutcherson, I think I think he's great. We can focus on a billion different details, but I actually just want to talk about one, one thing. So at the beginning of the movie, we establish that Katniss and her boyfriend, Gail, who we'll talk about later on, but Katniss is really good with a bow and arrow. She's really good at hunting, which obviously in a situation where uh, a bunch of kids need to like murder each other. That's good. That's you need you need to be c good with a thing that kills people. But for Peta, who's sent into the games with her, what we establish is that he's really good at painting because he makes cakes. He's a baker. And when I watched that, I I had a I, like I was thinking in my head, what? When are you gonna like? People are gonna try to kill you to distract them. You're gonna draw like a like a penis on their face and they're gonna be like, what? Well, no. This whole buildup with Peta being good at painting accumulates in this incredible scene. After some time where Katniss and Peta are separated, Katniss walks into like this area next to a river or something like that. And Peta, he's there as a rock. Peter is there and he's a, he painted his face <laughs> to look like a rock. <laughs> During his injury, he took the time to, to paint himself as a rock. How did he do this to himself, to his face? <laughs> well, he's injured. <laughs> also, he's a baker in one of like the poorest districts. He's making like the driest sort of most stale breads Possible. He's not decorating like <laughs> fancy ass wedding cakes like that. In this movie, we also get like a slight glimpse into the love triangle that's gonna happen in the rest of the movies. In this one, I feel like it's done pretty tastefully. Katniss has been dating Gail before she went into the games, but once they start getting into the whole the, the whole Hunger Games vibe, Peta and Katniss need to sell the idea that they have some sort of a relationship to help with people at home sponsoring them and sending them, you know, medical supplies and paint supplies as well, I guess. So we get this really interesting dynamic where in this film we're not sure if Katniss is really in love with Peta or not, or if she's just doing this for the cameras. But Peta, 
he is actually in love with her. So, you know, it's it's a little it's a little interesting sort of uh, thing going on. My biggest problem with this movie is that sometimes because they're trying to kind of fit in so many events from the books, it kind of feels weird, like the pacing of it all. For example, and again, spoilers, I remember I cried when uh, Rue's death scene happened in the books. When you read them, you get the real sense that her and Katniss have spent a lot of time together. In the movie, I think they spent like five minutes together and then she dies and I'm like, Okay, <laughs> I feel like if we spent more time in the games, which is, in my opinion, the most interesting bit of these movies, then, you know, I, f I feel like that would be better. I don't really see a lot of importance in just trying to tick off every single event that happened in the book just because it happened. I think more time in the games and less time in the capital would have been better. At the end of this, both Peta and Katniss uh, manage to, to live because they say that they're gonna eat some poisonous <laughs> berries and the people operating Stop. the game are like, whoa, whoa, uh, you can't, don't do that. It's gonna make this game look stupid. Would I have survived the Hunger Games? Um, absolutely. I'm also pretty good at drawing, admittedly not as good as Peta is. What I would have done is paint myself and make myself look like a, uh, like a knife and then people would carry me around the whole game that way I'll still be within the zone of the games and then at the end of it I'll be like hey, I'm actually a human. I'll pull out my little knife stab the 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 uh, the winner So Hunger Games 2 I think it's called catching fire cuz her dress is like on fire at some point. So Katniss is a bit of a celebrity in this one. The whole uh, stunt with the poisonous berries has made everyone be like, whoa, I think we're gonna make this person or uh, uh, icon for this rebellion that we're, g we're gonna do in the next movie. In many YA uh, novels slash movies, we get this phenomenon where with each movie where we see our protagonist, we kind of see this mountain of trauma just kind of stack up. We're at the end of the series. Our main character is sort of like a shell of who they used to be. It's actually pretty horrifying. President Snow, the bad dictator guy, really wants Katniss to die now. He's a bit pissed off that she's like a symbol now. He doesn't, he doesn't like that at all. He's pretty great in those movies. Look at this. They're holding hands. I want them dead. So he wants Katniss to die, but, you know, in a way where, like, it won't cause more rebellion. Because that would, uh, kind of suck. That would kind of suck on his end. That's kind of the whole thing that he's trying to avoid. So what he does, and I absolutely love the concept of this, is he decides to do an all-star season of the Hunger Games. All the past winners, all these people who've just, just had this horrible, traumatic, uh, kind of life. One of these people is like a 70 year old woman who doesn't speak and you know, they bring her back as well. And yeah, we're essentially supposed to see who's the hungriest of the hungry uh, gamers. <laughs> is it gonna be that 70 year old woman or will she just kind of walk into a fog of poison and die? Uh, we'll never know. <laughs> Would I have survived the events of this teen dystopia? Um, I don't think so. These Hunger Games are just a load of dog shit. <laughs> Let's talk about poisonous fog for a second. Poisonous fog. What is this load of horse shit? They're sleeping and you're sending poisonous fog after them? What the f***? are they even supposed to do? President Snow, you have completely lost the plot. This isn't what the Hunger Games is about. They somehow escaped the poisonous fog. I would have died in that bit already because I would have just been asleep and then a poisonous fog would have fucking killed me. About five minutes after that, they got a bunch of crazy little monkeys chasing them down. Crazy little rabid monkeys. How is that fair? And after they managed to run and escape from the monkeys, the crazy monkeys, they go to the shore and a tsunami is about to kill them. But then it's only like a tiny tsunami, AKA a wave. 
uh, so they're fine. I get, I get the whole thing, right? I get it. They're, they, they did. There's a thing, and all the, all the traps are actually. There's that the arena is like a clock or whatever, and the traps are set off at certain times. I don't give a shit. This is about the dynamic between all the the kids and the 70 year old woman who are trying to murder uh, each other. No one gives a rat's ass about the poisonous fog. You've completely removed the integrity of these games. President Snow, you dickbag. Love triangle update in this one. Gale is uh, starting to become a little shit. If you're team Gale and you're in my comments, what is wrong with you? Gale is like, Ooh, Katniss, I can't believe that you kissed PETA. That makes me so sad, Katniss. You dick! She was gonna die! She was- she was sent to a game where everyone needs to murder each other. What, what the f is wrong with you? She managed to save her life and the life of a friend. And you're like, ooh, I can't believe you kissed him. Shut up with your YA bullshit, man. I do love this movie though. I think it might be my favorite one in the whole series. I think I prefer the core plot of the first one, but as a movie, everything here feels uh, just a lot more cohesive. Everyone who made this is kind of like in their element now. And the ending in this, where Katniss shoots uh, 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 an arrow into the thing, and then the whole arena uh, like shuts down and then this happens you have been our mission from the beginning The plan was always to get you out Half the tributes were in on it. This is the revolution and you are the Mockingjay I was losing my shit when I read this part in the book. There's a revolution. Haymitch is there. I didn't mention Haymitch up until this point in the video, I realized. But Haymitch is there and then Gale says this shit. There is no District 12. It's all gone. And then Katniss is trembling like a storm is f***ing brewing inside of her. I was hyped as hell for the next one. Hunger Games 3. This series was making a lot of money. They didn't want it to end. So they split the last book into two parts, Harry Potter style. And what we get out of this is uh, like two movies that are just, just really stretched out. Just the plots of this are really, really stretched thin for absolutely no reason. Besides the fact that, you know, they made another $600 million or whatever. So Katniss is brought into District 13. You know how I said at first that there's only 12 districts? Uh, well, I actually uh, lied to you to trick you. At the beginning of this story, we think that the Capitol blew up District 13 because they rebelled against him. But actually, District 13, they're, they're around. They're just living under a bunker now. And we spend most of the movie inside of this bunker and it it feels it feels like a bottle episode really and it's not like nobody cared about these movies it's just the practical side of it shouldn't have been this long i think we get some of josh hutcherson and jennifer lawrence's best performances in this series <laughs> they're just so fucked up at this point it's pretty horrifying to see so after the last games were disrupted by katniss's arrow we find out that only she got rescued uh but Peta was not katniss is kind of losing her mind over this she's like where's Peta? where's Peta?" and after a while we suddenly see him i want everyone who's watching to stop and to think about what a civil war could mean. We almost went extinct once before. And, you know, he's saying all this stuff that the Capitol clearly put in his mouth. But instead of understanding this, everyone around starts being like, Get it! He's one of them! He's one of the bad guys! Guys, this is the same Capitol that makes children uh, murder each other for a reality TV show. Do you really think that, like, torturing a person and altering their brain is beneath them. <laughs> Gale comes into the room with a I told you so kind of face. Shut up, Gale. Did you see what he looks like? Uh, thank you. I saw a coward. You don't have any idea what he's going through. I don't through. care. I would never say what he just said. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Shut the hell up, Gale, before I smack your head with my fist. I hate this guy more than I hate President Snow. This guy's a Dickhead. The love triangle stuff here is really dumb at this point. All these characters are so like messed up and we're still focusing on this like dumb rivalry 
This happens right after Katniss sees uh, the, the ashes of her entire district. Every single person that she knew. What? What? This is dumb. This is very dumb. Kissing is dumb. <laughs> and this isn't a pro Peter thing either. He tries to like murder her at the end of this movie. They, they, they manage to uh, take him back from the capital. And he like chokes her and he tries to kill her. So that's not really great, I think. I do really like the whole focus on how uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman tries to turn Katniss into this sort of uh, propaganda piece, essentially. How do we create this bigger than life image of this person who in reality is not perfect. It also shows us that this universe has the option to pre-record videos. Um, something that I think the capital should know about. All of the events of Hunger Games probably wouldn't have happened if the capital stopped doing uh, live broadcasting. And I really mean it. It's almost every single event. In this movie, while Peter is being interviewed to do capital propaganda, he tells Katniss, hey, they're about to, to bomb District 13. They're coming, Katniss. They're gonna kill everyone. And in District 13, you'll be dead by morning! He's warning us. The whole thing with the berries in the first movie, like, they could have avoided the whole stress off of that, but just, like, I don't know, pausing the whole thing and being like, hey, you can't do that. Everyone knowing that Katniss shut down the Hunger Games with her arrow. All the victors holding hands in unity live on air to, to kind of put pressure on stopping the games. I want them dead. This scene from the second one. How many people saw it? Hard to say, there was a five second delay, but. Five seconds? You're just working with a five second delay? Guys, you're a, di you're a dictatorship. Making kids kill each other in an island is, is not beneath you. Uh, <laughs> so why is the moral line drawn at live broadcasting? I guess you could say that, you know, this is like just a result of their hubris, right? They don't care about live broadcasting everything, but that's dumb as fuck. <laughs> there are like six or seven major events throughout all of these films that drive the plot forward and lead to the fact that, you know, that the capital was taken down. That wouldn't have happened if they just didn't broadcast it live. I mean, when we see the rebels film all the propaganda stuff, we see that they have pretty good, like, CGI abilities. This is where their integrity lies. No. We're gonna screen these entire events. We can't lie to the people instead of when we uh, brainwash a guy and make him lie to the people. One last thing, every time they show Pete on TV, Katniss is like, oh my God, he's not doing very well. And Josh Hutcherson, he didn't like actually physically lose weight for those moments, which is absolutely fine. But instead what they did is that they both CGI'd him to make him look skinnier. And they also make his, his collar look tighter and tighter every single time. And by the last one, he kind of looks like a court jester. Hunger Games 4. So you know how I said that Peta was rescued from the capital? Well, we find out that this was apparently all parts of Snow's plan. Apparently, Snow thought that the most effective way of getting Katniss killed is to essentially brainwash Peta using uh, bees with mind-altering poison to get him to want to kill Katniss. That's why he goes and chokes her at the end of the last movie. That in his mind is the easiest way of killing her in a base filled with people with guns. But this isn't the end of this. You see Coin, the leader of District 13 and the rebels, she knew that this is the situation. That's why she risked her force to send them to go get Peta from the capital uh, because she knew that if Peta killed her and not if she killed her, that way Katniss won't be able to run against her in the presidential elections that will happen after the events of Hunger Games 4. So what they do is that they then decide to send Peta alongside with Katniss onto this uh, propaganda mission in the middle of a war zone. Peta is this mentally unstable man who was tortured with mind-altering poison bees, and he isn't sure what reality is. They put him in a battlefield, which pans out really well. Yeah, he murders one of the guys on the team. So that, 
that went really well. This movie isn't as bad as I thought it would be, uh, but I really miss them doing like a Hunger Game at this point. They sort of try and do it, you know, we, we see some like traps that the Hunger Game makers made. <laughs> But those are the bits that I like the least out of the Hunger Games. I don't give a shit about those traps. <laughs> I just want to see people going at it, you know, Fortnite style. Gale is here again and I still don't really like him. His first thought after seeing PETA and the horrible state that he's in is, huh, I wonder how that's going to affect this love triangle. I don't stand a chance if he doesn't get better. I'll never let him go. Listen, I... I really think that there are more important things going on right now. <laughs> Leave this poor girl alone, really. She's been through so much. Listen, I still definitely enjoy this movie. And I think that as a franchise, these four films are pretty solid. Yes, it gets stupid and it gets convoluted, but the core things still work pretty well. There's a reason the Hunger Games are as big as they are. If you're wondering, the winner of the love triangle is PETA. Him strangling Katniss in the last one did deduct some points away from him, but in this one, uh, Gale probably bombed Katniss's sister. In the books, he definitely knew about it. In the movies, he's like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I knew about this. Goodbye, Gail. But yeah, sucks to suck, Hemsworth, you dickhead. I don't think the actual, I don't think the actual actor is a dickhead. I don't, I don't know him. <laughs> okay, guys. I think we all have to admit, these, these aren't very good. <laughs> This movie's fun, I'll admit that. I had a good time watching it. It's a fun action movie with a lot of things that I like in it that I've already seen in other places. First clue to how confident they were in this movie is when it starts and you find out that it was apparently like Hans Zimmer was involved in this. And let me tell you, you can really feel his involvement in the making of this film. Now imagine a movie like this. There's this world where when teenagers arrive to a certain age, they get divided to certain uh, different groups, essentially, in some sort of ceremony. And every single one of these groups has sort of a different meaning, a different sort of personality attribute. There's like a brave one, there's a, a one for smart people, but our main character is a bit too special for that. They don't fully fit within that category. Sadly though, both of the parents, all of our main character, end up dying. And also, the factor slash home slash district that our uh, character is from gets eradicated. The dystopian leader of the area where the story takes place has sort of set a notion that beyond the borders of where everyone lives, there's essentially nothing. The outside district is essentially gone. But, in a later film, we find out that that's not true. Now you may think to yourself, Pinely, you just described two different movies. But no, I just described one movie that rips off those other two movies. F***ing Divergent. <laughs> so yes, this movie has four different factions. I couldn't, for the life of me, remember the names of them, even after watching three of these movies. But luckily, uh, Google exists, so I will read it off of that now. The factions are the Dauntless, who are supposed to be the brave. We have Amity, who are the kind. We have Erudite, who are the intelligent. And Abnegation, who are uh, the selfless. And also Candor, who are the honest. The hon- why did I pronounce the H like that? <laughs> Crap names, compare that to something like Slytherin, you know, that's- that sounds- that sounds like a bad guy. So our main character, Triss, when she becomes 16, on this appointed day, she needs to take, like, a drug or something, which is supposed to be part of a test to determine which factor is- does she belong to. Factor, faction, I'm probably gonna get the two words confused, but it is faction. <laughs> we find out that apparently she fits with all the factions, which makes her, a uh, Divergent, the name of the movie. Her being a Divergent is apparently bad 
but I I I don't I I don't think I ever got an, a, like a good explanation as to why. <laughs> they say that the factions were made to like maintain peace in a very vague way, but in practicality, in the actual ceremony that's after the test, the the kid is allowed to pick whatever faction they goddamn please. So what? So these people who can come from whatever home, whatever place, whatever whatever area, they all live in Chicago, whatever area in Chicago, they can pick whatever place they want to. So why, in God's name, would that help keep peace? That doesn't that doesn't make any sense. What is this test anyways? Is it just like a like one of those like stupid personality tests? Is it, is it like a BuzzFeed quiz? Besides being able to like shoot a gun well, which is something that our main character trains for, we don't really like like I don't get what makes her special. <laughs> the action scenes are fun. I enjoyed them. And I enjoyed a lot of this movie. But all throughout the back of my head I was like none of none of this makes sense. None of like a None like it like it's it's not it's nothing <laughs> so Triss even though she comes from abnegation who are the selfless Sure, she decides to, to go with dauntless the brave She can't tell anyone that she's actually a divergent because then she'd be like shot or something Because everyone in this in this movie is a moron also. I'll say this. I don't think that erudite are really that intelligent because uh, Triss's brother is in that, and he's like this bumbling moron throughout this throughout throughout this entire series. So yeah, the Dauntless are a pack of weirdos, but they're clearly supposed to be very cool. They're just jumping off of trains the, <laughs> the entire time. Like throughout this whole movie, it's specifically trains. They're jumping onto trains, off of trains, uh, uh, from like a building to like a like a net. Stop! Relax! What are you doing? <laughs> when they're showing Triss her living quarters, they find out that they have this fascinating toilet arrangement. I just disgusting. Who? Why did? Who? Why? Why did they do this? Why did they do this? What? <laughs> what is supposed to happen here? Are they supposed to be like taking a shit? And like sitting down in front of each other or like or like peeing in front of each like what's what's the situation here that you built this for just build stalls you dumbasses they're supposed to make them seem really cool like how Gryffindor is presented in Harry Potter but like they they don't shit they don't have to shit in front of each other in Gryffindor you bunch of weirdos. <laughs> it seems like the strategy for teen dystopias when it comes to giving characters memorable names is just giving them uh, the dumbest names. In Hunger Games, we have PETA and Catnip, but here we have... My name's Four. Four, like the number? What happened? One through three were taken? Ah, uh, he really didn't like that, did he? The first lesson you learn from me, if you want to survive here. Just keep your mouth shut. So yes, the hunk for this movie, his name is Four, which is what a shit name. What a what a, the hell? <laughs> what were you thinking to yourself? Four? You're calling him Four? It's a real shame because I I think he's one of the better uh, teen dystopian hunks in there. We're gonna give him a whole rating right now. So in terms of pure hunkness, this guy's a total hunk. A very, very attractive man, undeniable, has a good voice. He has a very, very calming sort of voice to him. I'm gonna give him uh, 10 points for that. Now let's examine the jawline. Okay, this is, this, this is a good jawline. This is one of the best jawlines in the hunk game. Liam Hemsworth, that's, that's, I mean, that jawline is... Undeniable. That's a good jawline right there. But the Hemsworth brothers, they're I, like they're like genetically made in a lab, so I don't feel like they count. I'm gonna have to give him 12 points for that jawline, yes, sir. But now let's talk personality. Most important thing for a good hunk. Uh, now, uh, compared to the the last two hunks from the from the Hunger Games, this one is actually like mainly nice uh, to. To, to the girl, so that's that's good. <laughs> he is essentially her commander in these movies, so yes, he does use his position of power to flirt with her, which is very bad, but you gotta remember that uh, Peta uh, tried to strangle C 
Katniss, and the other guy probably bombed her sister. So, you know, you gotta work with what you have over here. Uh, ten points. Everyone in these movies has the brain of, uh, what a peanut has in his brain. A day after this guy tries to kill Triss for being really good at all the tests, he comes up to her, and he's like, Oh, please forgive me. Please, I didn't mean to fucking throw you off of a cliff. And then she's like, what? What, you just... You just tried to do the murder. Like, that was yesterday. You, you can't... That was yesterday. So then, obviously, he then decides to be the one that jumps off of a cliff. And, like... What? What are you even trying to do here? Was she supposed to do something differently? It's my fault that he's dead. No, it's not because of you. Your fault for what? He's the one that did- that tried to do the murder. <laughs> the villain in this is so comically evil. The brilliance of the faction system is the conformity to the faction removes the threat of anyone exercising their independent will. She wants to put chips and all the dauntless brains so they can uh, then go and kill all the faction that is like her kind of rival party essentially. But then the good guys win because Triss is uh, divergent. Apparently this chip is not very effective because it can easily be dismantled by holding someone's face and saying, it's me, it's me, it's me, wake up, it's me. <laughs> Would I have survived this dystopian scenario? Absolutely not. If I had to jump off of one of those trains, I would- I would die. The most original thing about these movies is probably how they decided to name them. The first Divergent movie is called Divergent. Fair enough. Fair play. Nothing to say about that. Second movie, though, as you've probably seen in the title screen, is called Insurgent. And the third one is called Allegiant. What? <laughs> Making this essentially the Gent series. The J Gent. Every movie ends with Gent. It was really hard for me to remember this movie. It's just like this vague mishmash of the bad guys winning and then the good guys winning. The security for the bad guys, may I say, is horrible. Our main characters just kind of barge into whatever area that they want at any time. They tell us in this movie about this big fucking wall that's there to protect, uh, protect us all from all the bad things. We are all that is left of humanity. The vast wall that encloses this city may protect us from our toxic surroundings. I've seen enough teen dystopians to know that the thing on the other side of the wall is probably all right. There's probably life over there. Triss and her hot boyfriend are on the run now. Triss has a bunch of nightmares now about all the trauma that she has now from the last movie. They're doing the trauma stack up again, like in Hunger Games, like in Harry Potter again. You killed us all. No! She has so much trauma that she decides to cut her hair. And her boyfriend absolutely loves it. Well, it's definitely different. <laughs> he fucking hates it. I don't oppose her changing her look, or more specifically, getting short hair. But that haircut is uh, criminal for a girl who's supposed to be like... 16. I forgot to say, but Miles Teller is in these movies, playing the most unlikable man on planet Earth. Tris, I think you should go to Erudite and kill Janine yourself. I'll stay with Caleb so that you don't get him killed too. His character should die, I think. The deaths in this mean nothing. I did not care when her parents died. She keeps crying in this movie about how she had to kill Max in the last one uh, because he was mind controlled. I don't know how that guy fucking looks like. We find out that she's 100% divergent in this. Divergent. 100%. I'll be damned. She has big ADHD. Everything in these films just feels fake. It's a fake world, a fake villain, fake dumb names, fake chemistry. There's like a point where Triss's brother betrays her and essentially almost gets her killed 
Uh, I, I, I didn't care. How can he fail so much at telling a story where I don't even care about this level of betrayal? There's not enough work done in this to make Triss a character that you really love. It's not the fault of the actress. She's just kind of given nothing to play with. What are her personality traits? I don't know. You can say a lot about like the world building in Hunger Games, but at the very least, you have this very strong root, which is Katniss's character. She's incredibly developed. You feel for her, you feel every nuance in her decision. With Triss, I don't know why she wants to do half of the things that she does. Her personality trait is that she has all personality traits. <laughs> her thing as a character is that none of her qualities are more substantial than the other, which leads us with a nothing of a character. At the end of the first movie, our protagonist is mind controlling the villain and has the option to kill her and end this whole thing, but she chooses not to. Why? Because we need to try and squeeze three more movies out of this stupid franchise. I don't know what the motives are of f anyone. Snow motives are very clear, you know? Whether they're good or absolutely evil, he explains them very clearly throughout these films. I don't really understand what's this woman's big deal with divergence. <laughs> Every time a character is in a tough spot in any of these movies, it's solved by like two headbutts and a punch. If you're an actor and you manage to survive a career after these movies, you should get $100 million as compensation. I was shocked. I, I cannot tell you my, my surprise and my shock when I found out that Miles Teller gave his whatever kind of performance in this during the same year he did Divergent in the very same year that he did Whiplash. He did Divergent. Fucking Divergent in the same year as 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 the one of my favorite movies. His performance in Whiplash is incredible. There's so much to that character, so much that you can empathize with. What's going on over here? He probably signed a deal to do all three of these movies when Hunger Games was being very, very popular, before Whiplash got the reception that it was. Just just sucks that he had to do this for three movies. <laughs> also, apparently there's like life behind that uh, big wall. So, who would have guessed that one? <laughs> Divergent 3 or whatever this one's called. What were they thinking? Hey, whoa, hey, what are you doing? Put me down! <laughs> we're not gonna focus too much of the plot of this one. I think we've established uh, that it really doesn't matter this much. They, Triss and her hot boyfriend and their gang, they go beyond the wall and they find out that there's a bunch of people there that that live in a good place and they created the factions. You see, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> they did it as some sort of experiment and Divergence are actually the good, the good ones. They're the pure ones, whatever. Right? It doesn't- this doesn't mean anything. The leader of this whole situation is like the guy from Dumb and Dumber. I forgot his name. He's a very good actor. Uh, but he's also found out to be a bad guy at the end. It's- it's what they did- it's- it's what they did in Hunger Games, you know? I don't care about that. I don't give a shit about any of that. I just want to focus on the insanity of this movie. So first of all, let's talk about the ADRs. ADR is automated dialogue replacement. They go crazy with the ADRs in this movie. We should slaughter you! Kill him! And then after that, we get to see this shot. When I saw this shot, I wrote in my notes that this is the funniest shot that I've ever seen in any movie ever. Little did I know that less than three minutes after that, it was topped by this fucking thing. We're gonna be okay. What? What are these fucking bubbles? What is this? <laughs> what is this? This looks really bad. This looks like something from Shark Boy and Lava Girl. What? 
are they doing over here? Tristan goes into some CGI goo and it looks like the Nickelodeon slime. Oh my god, this is the ugliest movie I've ever seen in my whole life. Dumb and Dumber guy is the leader and he shares how he watched Triss as a little girl. I watched you being born. I saw the love that your mother and father had for you. I watched a little girl have a happy childhood and grow into a courageous young woman. Which may sound creepy, but not as creepy as what he actually meant, which is apparently his entire society for the past 200 years has been watching Triss's entire society in Chicago uh, like a sort of Truman Show kind of thing. The story at this point is so far removed from the original that for you to seriously enjoy this, you need to like actually like these characters, which uh, of course you don't. Why Why would you? <laughs> Everyone here is a moron. None of their decisions make sense. This sort of new regime that they're going into decides to bring four on one of their secret evil missions and tell them all about their secret evil plans. This is the guy who toppled a, like another bad regime like a week ago, you morons. There's this really cringe scene where Dumb and Dumber brings uh, Triss to talk in front of a bunch of evil politicians. Human beings cannot be categorized in this way. It doesn't work. And maybe it's time to start embracing everyone instead of dividing them into groups. Yeah, you know, if all these evil politicians from around the world just had a, just had a folksy girl talk some sense into them, the world wouldn't be as bad of a place. No. Oh, no, you're- that's dumb. <laughs> anyone can just walk into any room. There's no security for anyone. Triss, at some point, steals President Dumb and Dumber's ship, and there's no real percussions to make something like that not happen. Where are you going? Taking your ship and I'm not coming back. You can't fly. Any person in this universe can just go into President Dumb and Dumber's office and steal whatever the fuck they want because there's no there's no locks on anything this it's chaos it's there's no security guards what the what the hell are you doing what is the legacy of divergent absolutely nothing <laughs> these movies suck these movies suck so much especially this one. First one was fun this one <laughs> remember earlier when i said that they were supposed to make four divergent movies well they did it this is the last one Thank God. It could be because this movie is a pile of ass, but it could also be because what are these names? As a casual viewer, as a non-fan, why would you see the name Allegiant and think that it's a sequel to Divergent? The main character doesn't even have the same haircut for Christ's sake. Would I survive this scenario? I don't know, I guess I'd just float around in their dumb CGI bubble. This movie ends with her doing another one of her speeches. She does a lot of speeches and voiceovers in this movie. But ha ha ha, I don't care. Your speech doesn't mean anything to me because you. there's not another movie. There's not, there's no, there's no other Divergent. What would you have called the fourth one? Man, manage, meant? No, that doesn't end with Jet. I don't care, because a fourth one would never exist. The fourth book is apparently just called Four, but I think that's just like a collection of short stories. They really thought like, yeah, we're the type of... Our franchise is good enough to split the last book into two parts. Maybe if you did a better job, you know? Maybe if you made the movies better. Can't comment on the quality of the books, because I've, I've never read them. Okay, let's talk about Maze Runner. Maze Runner was like an ocean of sanity after dumb uh, divergent. Dumb virgent? Dumb virgin. That's, that's a good joke. The plot wasn't devised by uh, the insane monkeys from Hunger Games. It was made by like a human and like it makes sense. Our characters have motivations that make sense. No one is just like evil because Oh, I choose to be evil now. This is just a calm family movie about a group of kids traveling through a maze. There was this fascinating sense of mystery in the first Maze Runner. We start off not even knowing our main character's name. He doesn't know his own name. He doesn't know where he's at. He doesn't know why he's there. And the plot moves forward as us and Thomas, which is his name, 
piece out what's going on here bit by bit. When he wakes up, we realize a few things. A, him and everyone there is in a similar situation. All of the boys in this, uh, grassy sort of area, none of them remember their past at all. And beyond the grass, we see this massive wall which leads to the maze. And so the plot is pretty straightforward. We reach to the end of the maze and uh, find out what this great mystery is all about. And you know what? That's a good thing. The fact that the plot doesn't have as many events inside of it works a lot better uh, for the film format that it's in. I really like the relationship between all the all the guys, all the all the teens that are there. Some of them look like actual teens, and some of them look like they're uh, like 30. <laughs> Not really 30, but like my age. All these people are pretty nice to each other, and when they're not, there's a valid reason for it. It doesn't do this thing that I hate, where the plot moves forward, uh, just because the characters, I don't know, f misunderstand each other, or uh, they just hate each other for no real reason. That never happens. There is a character that hates Thomas, but that's because um, a bunch of batshit crazy stuff starts happening uh, after Thomas gets to, to where they all live. Like most of his friends die. So that's like a legitimate assumption to, you know, to make. <laughs> and then after Thomas wakes up, he's told that they have two rules over there. I don't remember the other one, but the first one was uh, that you can't, you can't go into that maze, man. Never go beyond those walls. And about three minutes pass, and then this happens. <laughs> hey! All of the sequences inside of the maze are stressful as shit. You don't know what's gonna happen. You know that, you know, Thomas is not gonna die because he's like the main guy. But with all the other kids, it's free game. And let me tell you, this movie is fucking terrifying. So many kids die in such a brutal way by these monsters who have like a, like a Doc Ock sort of tentacle kind of situation. And they, and like, even ones that I really like. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. At some point throughout the movie, we're introduced to Chuck, who's my favorite, my favorite kid in, in this... I'm talking about Chuck. Stop riding your motorcycle. We're introduced to Chuck, and Chuck is a legend. He says my favorite line in any teen dystopia movie ever. Girls are awesome. Hey Chuck. You're awesome too, man. He has so many great moments. This kid is great. Doc, why would you give this to me? I can't remember them anyway. But maybe if you find a way out, you can give it to them for me. He's so cool, man. You love Chuck. I love Chuck. He's great. Well, he dies. Chuck dies. I made you like him because I wanted you to feel what I felt when Chuck died. He d it made me so sad. Anyways, Thomas manages to convince a bunch of them to go through that maze and then they get to the end of it and then they find out that all all of this was actually orchestrated by a company called Wicked. <laughs> that is literally their name. It's really, really on the nose. They watch this video by the, by the evil lady from the company and she's like, yeah, seems like I'm gonna die now, but you're still gonna have to complete this uh, maze because you guys are the maze runners. And then she uh, shoots herself in the head and like you finish it off being like, damn, this franchise is gonna follow these kids who, you know, complete these messed up tasks made by a ghost, essentially. Gally, I think that's his name, it's a dumb teen dystopian name. He's the guy who didn't like uh, Thomas, and he goes maze crazy. I belong to the maze. And he's the one who kills Chuck, so obviously they need to kill him because that's the worst thing that anyone can ever do. And then a bunch of soldiers rescue the kids, and then we find out that the lady who died is actually not dead and is actually alive. So it's essentially like Saw for teenagers, really. Maze Runner 2. Also, I forgot to say, uh, but I definitely wouldn't survive the events of Maze Runner 1. I'm incredibly clumsy, so when running on one of those narrow bridges, I would probably uh, slip on a banana and fall to my death. So after the first one, what I mainly expected is that, you know, they get dragged out by uh, the fake good people who are actually the evil people, and very quickly get thrown into what is another maze or another sort of puzzle that they need to solve, because I was like, this is the Saw franchise. This is the Saw franchise for teenagers. But let me tell you, I couldn't have predicted 
anything about this movie because it is wild. In this movie, we find out that the Maze Runner is actually a zombie franchise? <laughs> There's even the whole classic scene of one of the guys in the group finds out that he got scratched and then he's like, ah, oh, you guys gotta let me go. You guys gotta give me a gun. I don't wanna turn into one of them. So this is the plot of this one. After they got taken away by the fake good guys who are actually just the bad guys from earlier, the company Wicked, Thomas finds out incredibly quickly uh, what's going on over here. Which is something that I really like about this series. It doesn't drag on at all. It's a very non-bullshit sort of story. Thomas realizes that Wicked's whole plan is to take uh, these kids who for some reason show a level of immunity to the zombie virus and put them through this maze because for some reason they can then like extract uh, the thing that makes them immune. This movie just goes crazy. There's like a secret legion of people who use zombies as guard dogs. We see a party where Thomas takes a drug and then he sees like two zombies fight each other like they're Pokemon. Giancarlo Esposito is in this and he's incredible. Love that man to bits. Put him in more movies. Put him in everything. Put him in every franchise. Please, 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 please put him in my face. At the time of recording this, I still haven't seen Maze Runner 3. So what I'm curious about, is that one gonna take like a different horror kind of genre and, you know, uh, make it for teenagers? Because... That's pretty- that's a pretty cool sort of concept, I guess. There's some pretty vile shit here, man. I think I was like 15 when this came out, and even as a teenager, I think I would have been a bit scarred by some of those scenes. The whole moral question with the bad guys here is a lot more interesting. They are certain that extracting all that brain juice from these kids is the way to save the world. We see this post-apocalyptic world. It's shit, man. Those zombies are dickheads and they ruin everything. The fact that it's not really as black and white as uh, Bits and Divergent, where a character's whole motivation is like, I'm gonna do a racism because uh, I'm, that's, that's gonna help me with my next elections. And I know what you might be thinking, or, when Hunger Games uh, changed its concept by a lot, you were, you were angry, you were furious. I remember this happening earlier in the video. You were running around like a, like a madman, screaming inside your room. Why are you giving Maze Runner a pass? Well, because Maze Runner 2 didn't spend a whole movie inside a bunker. And then you may also say, but or, that's my actual name by the way, uh, the third Divergent movie, whatever that one's called, they also changed the plot and you didn't like that. Uh, and they didn't, they weren't in a bunker. Well, that's because Allegiant uh, can suck my ass. That movie's so bad. <laughs> I like the characters in Maze Runner. They're, they're nice. They're, they're fun to watch. <laughs> Maze Runner 3, whatever that one's called, the, the death? Cure? The death? Yeah, I think it's called the death cure. So this is the last movie. I just realized that like, they only ran through a maze like twice throughout this franchise. So I just wanted to point that one out. <laughs> At the end of the last movie, the bad guys came over to where all the good guys were hiding and they kidnapped Mino, a legend and a great part of the Maze Runner crew. I really like him as as I like the rest of the crew. They're all they're all great. The reason they managed to do that is because Teresa decided to rat everyone out to Wicked, which is really like that's like a not a cool thing to do. She did it because she thought it would be a necessary sacrifice to try and find the zombie cure. Uh, which, I, I mean, I get that, but that's still like incredibly rude to do. So I thought that this would be another twist on a horror subgenre. But no, they just go like full blown action in this. The start of this movie is just Mad Max. They're driving these old cars in the desert. John Carlo Esposito points an old ass gun out of a window and he's like, mother I'm John Carlo Esposito. I'm gonna blow your goddamn head off. He's just so cool in these movies. It's such a delight to see him. Whatever you say, hermano. 
There's a bit where he comes to save everyone and he's on a spaceship. All right, boys, we're here. Awesome stuff. This man is a great actor. Stop just casting him as a villain. Give him every role in, in Hollywood, please. This movie really strengthens the fact that the friendship and the chemistry of this group is really one of the most defining features of Maze Runner. I love seeing the whole gang just in full friendship mode doing action stuff together. It's really fun, and it also makes you realize how sulky and mean everyone is in other teen dystopias. Like, I get that you're having a bad time, I, I get that, but come on, friendship. So we find out that there's only the one city. city left in this horrible, horrible world, and Thomas wants to go straight into there and get their friend Mino back. We get all these interesting moments in this film of Teresa trying to rationalize to herself her decision. Everything we're doing here. It's working. Do you understand? That's why this is so important. I think this scene is great. I love how important it is for her to try and clear her conscience. I love the fact that the moral question here is actually, you know, something that you can think about. Should we torture a bunch of children if it gets us the cure to this zombie thing? If it saves the whole world? You know, it's like a it's like a massive trolley problem, essentially. Also, Will Poulter is alive. The mother who killed Chuck. Hey, Greeny. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Will Poulter, you son of a bitch! You killed Chuck. You will see the wrath of Pinely till the end of times, you big piece of shit. I actually, I actually like Will Poulter quite a bit. He's a, he's a great actor. They really go full action blockbuster. There are some stunts here that are just fast and furious level. They're doing this whole heist to bring back Mino. But meantime, Mino is actually the Hulk and he throws a guy out of a glass. They're cornered in a room, but don't worry because they just jump out of a window from a building into like a puddle of water, but they survive because when you land on water, there's no fall damage. Then there's a bus filled with rescued children that gets lifted up by a crane, and then that gets thrown on the ground, but the, the kids are fine. <laughs> they end the whole thing with the rebellion doing some sort of war against the dystopian government, which, now that I think about it, that's... That's how all these franchises end. <laughs> it's all of them. Happens in Hunger Games, happens in Divergent, happens in this one. They just can't get enough of a, of like a, that thing. And then after that, both in Hunger Games and in this, we see the main character in like a nature-y sort of place. And, and they're like, they're like, yeah, I guess I have trauma, but I'm also feeling pretty blissful at the moment. Divergent didn't get to have that ending because it's the worst, uh, movie. All in all, pretty solid series, you know? The end bit with the war does drag on too much. I feel like they never really managed it to do that well. <laughs> it dragged on in Hunger Games. It God knows that it dragged on in Divergent, and it happened again now. But I think that if you're looking for a pretty fun way to scar, uh, your little sibling or like a cousin or something, uh, show them those movies, you know? <laughs> They're genuinely a great time. The cast is great. Are they a bit generic? Yeah, at times, but I think they do have a bunch of heart to them. <laughs> oh, yes. We're filming now. I'm excited to watch this movie. I'm literally in the process of moving places. I don't have my lights anymore. I'm using my phone, but my flash on my phone. But God damn it. I went to see the new Hunger Games movie just now. This is gonna be the best movie ever. This guy, is that snow? Is that supposed to be yeah, yeah. snow? Wow, he's really hot. It's me buying the tickets. This is footage that I'm gonna use in the video. Restricted viewing, oh no. Is this gonna be scary? Are you old enough for this? No, I'm, I'm actually 10 years old. It's gonna be difficult. It's gonna be a rough one. I watched this movie after watching 10 movies in this genre in a row. This is admittedly 
a really bad way to, <laughs> to consume movies. When I sat down and the trailer started playing, I was full of dread. I really didn't want to watch another teen dystopian movie. But then I watched it. And I... Hello, I just watched uh, this movie. Can you ask me what I think? Um, what do you... what did you think? And I really, really liked it. <laughs> I like this movie about the sexy uh, Hitler origins. I had so much fun. I was really pleasantly surprised by how well made this movie is. I'd go see this movie just for Viola Davis playing this complete, uh, just extravagant lunatic. He's so unbelievably extra and so much fun to watch on screen. Jason Schwartzman is a delight to watch in this. His character is just so incredibly funny. It's really fun to watch kind of the news presenter version of Stanley Tucci's character, but, you know, what is essentially supposed to be like a 40s, uh, sort of setting. Reporting on the Hunger Games when it was essentially a failing TV show. Rachel Ziegler, I wasn't as excited by her performance. I don't think that she was bad or anything. They just, they made her sing a lot. It's a, like a really big part of this movie. It's this, this thing is sort of a musical. Also, this is how I'd like the Hunger Games themselves to be filmed. It looks brutal. You know, the, the camera is so like attached to every swipe and every stabbing that happens in this. You really feel every death. Whereas in with the original one, you don't really get the full impact of the brutality of what's happening in front of you. And all in all, it's just really fascinating to see uh, the progression of this character losing his humanity bit by bit. I think I'm ready to do my ranking. Hunger Games 2 and this new one are essentially on the same level for me. I, I don't think that this movie has quite anything that's like Jennifer Lawrence as Katniss Everdeen. And I think just for that, I'm gonna have to put Catching Fire as my favorite one out of these 11 films. And it's this new one, Ballads of Songbird and, and a Snake. Then it's the first Hunger Games movie. Then it's Maze Runner 1. Then it's Maze Runner 2. Then it's Maze Runner 3. Then it's Hunger Games 4. Hunger Games 3, sorry, not sorry. And then I think we have uh, just the three divergence left. You could just place them all in, in their order. <laughs> Straight at the bottom where they belong. I did it. The story that I said at the beginning with the power supply is over. It's over. <laughs> I would have done something else for the ending, but man, I like, I just, uh, you gotta understand. I'm, I'm really in between things. I gotta move my computer somewhere else now.